The first Dishonored caught the gaming world by surprise with its unique look, addictive gameplay, and environmental storytelling. So it made all the sense in the world to make a sequel, and there's a lot to delve into with the new island of Karnaka. Hi, I'm Jacob with the leaderboard, and it's time to load up on some SNJ health elixirs because we're counting down 107 facts about Dishonored 2. Let's get started. <laughs> Dishonored 2 was officially announced at E3 in 2015. Harvey Smith, the co-creative director of Arcane Studios, actually didn't love the announcement trailer for the game. He admitted that it was a little too violent. However, he knew that the average consumer wouldn't want to watch a two-minute trailer of someone just sneaking around. I mean, I, w I, mean, I would've been cool with that, but he he's right, he's right. When the first Dishonored came out, it was regarded as one of the best games of 2012 and was ranked Game of the Year by numerous outlets. Given that success, Smith was excited about making a sequel, but also extremely nervous. The first game was designed to be self-contained and didn't lay any foundation for a sequel, but then it became a huge hit critically and commercially, which was enough for Arcane Studios to hit the drawing board and develop a second game. Smith knew that making a sequel to Dishonored would be incredibly difficult. His first goal was to give players a giant space that they could approach however they saw fit. All the other goals in making Dishonored 2 came secondary to the idea of having that giant space. Smith admitted that it was a mad scramble to please the two, quote, masters, which were game design and compelling narrative, respectively. During its early development, Dishonored 2 worked under the name Black Sparrow and was meant to be the original subtitle for the game. However, since Arkane knew that they wanted to release DLC in the future, the titles ended up being too long after adding on the DLC name. Gaming website VG247 tried to leak Dishonored 2 with what appeared to be box art for the game that had the subtitle Darkness of Tivia. Unfortunately, that ended up being a fake leak since that wasn't the title, like, at all. Smith and his team have a rule against responding to leaks since there isn't really any point in doing so. He noted, however, that he thought the title Darkness of Tivia was super f dumb. Arcane had a unique approach when it came to designing the core elements of both Dishonored games. They used as many non-combative verbs as possible. Adding something as simple as a telescope function or eavesdropping on a conversation gave the player choices other than just sheer violence. The development team believed that the Dishonored series could be summed up in just two general terms, exploration and improvisation. The whole goal is that the player feels like there isn't just one path to completing a level or objective. The core concept of Dishonored 2 was Emily Caldwin, the young empress of the first game. Smith Smith was curious about what Emily's character would be like 15 years after the first Dishonored story and how players could utilize a new skill set. As with any game in development, Emily's appearance went through many different clothing designs. Early concept art shows her wearing some type of garb around her head with nothing at all covering her face. Ultimately, the team decided on having her wear the mask that covers half her face. The decision to make Emily a main protagonist in Dishonored 2 was due in part to criticism, particularly criticism of the treatment of female characters in the first game. Nice to know that they consider people's input. Critic Anita Sarkeesian wrote that that while she did enjoy the first Dishonored, she was disappointed in how female characters were treated in the narrative. Smith was at first defensive about the criticism, but eventually took it to heart and saw it as a learning experience when creating Dishonored 2. Smith did not want Emily to be the female version of Corvo. He wanted an idol for young girls, similar to his childhood idol, Luke Skywalker. He had no interest in appealing to the male gaze for Emily, but rather wanted to make a unique character with her own tragedies, growth, and sense of progression. The team was surprised by how much fans loved Emily in the first Dishonored. Smith was worried about having a child as a prominent character because he knew that kids can either come off as compelling or extremely annoying, and it's much more often the latter. The art direction in Dishonored 2 featured dedicated artists working on elements as insanely detailed as Emily's clothes and how her sleeves would react to light and how the weight of her clothes would impact her. Unlike Emily, Corvo wasn't given a voice actor until in the second game. Smith believes that Corvo could have been a stronger character if he was voiced in Dishonored, but made the decision too late in development. Smith felt voice acting added a new level of immersion to the story. He also felt that the voice acting served as a game mechanic in helping guide the player if they got lost by having Corvo or Emily look at a sign and say a hint or clue. The voice acting changed how characters interact with the environment. Based on who the player is and their level of chaos, Corvo and Emily will say different things in regards to objects that they come in contact with, adding another layer of interactivity with the voiceover. Despite the mechanical perks and immersive impact of voice acting, Smith didn't think it was completely essential, which is why it didn't play as big a role in the first game. He viewed it as adding an extra level, not necessary 
to the game. The development team considered adding the option to disable the voice acting because they were nervous that fans were accustomed to a silent hero. Ultimately, they decided to keep it as a core and permanent concept within the game. Development for Dishonored 2 began around the same time as the DLC for the first game. As a result, the two DLC add-ons that came out for the first Dishonored actually served as an experiment for Dishonored 2. The creators added a speaking role for the main character in the DLC as a way to test it out before including it in Dishonored 2. One of the biggest changes in the voice work was The Outsider. Billy Lush was the original voice actor before being replaced by Robin Lord Taylor in Dishonored 2. The change in voice actors was primarily due to scheduling conflicts and other factors that prevented Lush from reprising his role as The Outsider. While the actors gave their own unique performances, Smith believes that both were true to the character. Similarly, Smith felt that Chloe Grace Moretz, who voiced Emily in Dishonored, and Erica Luttrell, who voiced her in Dishonored 2, both gave performances that were true to the character. Basically, all the VO actors just nailed it. While Dishonored 2 features a quote, living, breathing world, Smith thinks that the term living world is too generic because any game can say that, but each one is unique. Part of what makes the Dishonored world living is that if you go into a person's room, you get the feeling of a lived in space and a sense of that character. To add to the feeling of a living world, there are a lot more NPCs throughout the city. Smith wanted their dialogue to feel like a slice of life where they may comment on current political standings or what they plan on having for lunch. Lead designer Dean Gabakaba feels that there's a lot more to Dishonored games than fighting and stealth. While those are the two driving elements, he designed them to feel like exploration games as well. He wanted players to feel like they're part of the world. When the writing team was developing the characters, they didn't want anyone to feel generic or just like a cardboard cutout. Every character's design and dialogue was designed by choice and it was meant to evoke some kind of feeling or impact, no matter how subtle it may have been. The art team actually had clay sculptures made of a lot of the character models. This allowed them to see how they would look in a full 360 degree perspective and was a test to see if the models would make sense in the game. The clay sculptures were so impressive that they were actually featured in a museum in Paris. They were featured at the Aglidique Museum as part of the art in video games The French Inspiration Exhibit. One of the biggest changes to Dishonored 2 was how the level of chaos was measured. In the first Dishonored, it was based purely on how many people were killed in a playthrough. For 2, it's based on who you kill in the game. Sounds like advice for a job interview. It's not how you kill, it's who you kill. The heart, which was given to Corvo by the outsider in the first game, was used immensely by players to the point where it shocked Smith himself. The studio decided to have the heart serve a more important role in 2. For example, if it was pointed at a guard, you'd gain more perspective on them. They could be somebody working double shifts to support a family, and if killed, would contribute more to your chaos level. Arcane Studios didn't just hire programmers. To make the world as immersive as possible, they hired industrial designers and architects to help development and ensure that every building made made sense geometrically. A challenge that Arcane Studios put on themselves was that they wanted every piece of furniture or prop in the game to feel real, to the point where everything in the game could actually be created in real life. Seriously, the attention to detail in this game is crazy. On top of that, nearly every item that could possibly be interactive actually is interactive in Dishonored 2. Details as small as being able to use a typewriter or turning on a faucet were not overlooked. One of Smith's inspirations for the mission design came from Edgar Allan Poe's theory of the unity of effect. Poe believed that short stories are more powerful than novels because they're able to make an impact in a small amount of time rather than being stretched out. He wanted Dishonored missions to have a similar impact, which is why the games don't delve into an entire open world. The game is designed to have quiet moments and areas meant for solving puzzles or taking in the environment while more chaotic areas are meant for combat. This is so that players never get overwhelmed with a puzzle during combat. Karnaka, the new city in Dishonored 2, was actually based off of real life places. Smith said it was modeled after Greece, Spain, and Italy. Karnaka is a huge shift from Dunwall, the city featured in the first game. The art director, Sébastien Mithon, wanted a more vibrant and colorful world for Dishonored 2. Dunwall was much more bleak and gloomy, while Karnaka has brighter flora, sunshine, and a more lived-in feel overall. At first, Smith wanted Dishonored 2 to take place in Dunwall, but Mithon wanted to try something new. He had the idea of an island that's on the outskirts of the world, which would allow for a unique atmosphere that would separate it from Dunwall. Mithon's inspiration for Karnaka actually came from a trip he took to Los Angeles. He visited Long Beach and noticed that the sunset impacted a lot of the atmosphere within the city and wanted to translate that into Karnaka, which is why the sun is such a vital element within the city. Karnaka also allowed for the development team to rethink how the architecture works within the world. The city features buildings with flatter rooftops, which may not seem like much, but it actually allows for an endless amount of new gameplay discoveries. Christopher Carrier, the lead level designer, believed that the flat rooftops and new building designs allowed for more freedom. Players could blink to balconies, take stairs, or even climb up light poles to reach areas that couldn't be reached within the first game. During development, the art department and level design team clashed on how players would disable the windmills that power Karnaka. The level design team wanted to be able to shoot the blades, but the art department didn't believe that bullets could stop the massive machines. So the compromise was a lever right in the middle of the 
pole that players could use to disable the windmills. In Dishonored 2, players have the choice to refuse the mark from the outsider, meaning the player would have no supernatural powers, just regular combat skills and limited acrobatics. The game is designed so that players can get to any area regardless of the mark. While it may seem counterintuitive to design special abilities only to lock them away, Bakaba and his team decided that they were confident enough in the core gameplay to trust that it would stand on its own. The first Dishonored left a lot of unanswered questions that Smith wanted to try to answer in Dishonored 2. However, he also wanted to add a new question within the game for every question that was answered, so we're never fully gonna understand Dishonored. The development team created their own calendar years and months for the Dishonored world. The calendar year lasts 13 months, and each month has 28 days. The first Dishonored didn't actually list or reveal a specific year in which it took place, but for Dishonored 2, the team decided to choose a specific year for both games. They eventually settled on 1852 and decided that the first one took place around 1837. The team settled on 1837 because that was around the same time that the legend of spring Heeled Jack came to London. spring Heeled Jack, as the story state, was a guy who wore a demonic mask, jumped around from rooftop to rooftop, and would magically appear in random places. So it, it made sense that Corvo would be marked by the outsider around the same time that the legend of spring Heeled Jack came to be. A lot of fans have stated that there's almost too much to see in Dishonored, and Dishonored 2 continued that trend. Smith intentionally wanted both games to feel like it's near impossible to see everything within one playthrough, which encourages replayability. Emily's abilities are meant to be reflective of her as an empress. Mesmerize is meant to distract a crowd and keep them busy, while Domino forces multiple people to share the same fate. On the flip side, Emily also has abilities which can overtake her. One ability in particular is Shadow Walk, which forces Emily into a moment of darkness of becoming something she isn't entirely. Dishonored 2 runs on a modified version of the ID6 engine, which is called the Void Engine. The first Dishonored ran on Unreal Engine 3, but Arcane Studios wanted to have their own in-house engine for Dishonored 2 due to the overall graphic improvements needed for the game. The in-house engine helped a lot when it came to technical issues because they were able to fix any issues that popped up. This helped immensely when it came to designing the level A Crack in the Slab, which featured the character jumping between time periods. In order to jump between time periods, the level design team had to stack the levels on top of each other multiple times. This would have been incredible incredibly difficult for the team to do if they didn't have their own engine and had to rely on support from outside sources. Crack in the Slab is widely regarded as one of the most memorable moments in Dishonored 2, though the actual core concept has existed at least since Bioshock 2. Wait, Arcane helped develop Bioshock 2? That actually makes a lot of sense. Arcane Studio actually assisted a lot in the development of Bioshock 2. They helped create a scripted mission where the player would be taken back and forth in time. The only difference here is that it was scripted and not controlled, unlike in Dishonored 2, where the player can jump back and forth in time whenever they see fit. Arcane didn't just include this element for the sake of it. It actually makes sense from a story perspective since, spoiler alert, it reveals how Delilah was able to escape from the Void and take over Dunwall. The timepiece serves as the tool that allows Emily or Corvo to jump through time. The developers took this tool one step further by adding fan-like transparent blades that functioned as a collective looking glass which offered players a glimpse at what they would teleport to. It gave a sense of heightened strategy and made sure there weren't any cheap teleports into a group of enemies. One change in a crack in the slab is that neither Corvo nor Emily have any of their active abilities at their disposal. The only abilities available during the mission are passive ones. The team thought that the timepiece itself was a powerful ability that added a new layer to solving puzzles so they opted to remove all of the players' abilities for the sequence. Kakier wanted the choices made during a crack in the slab to have an overall impact in the story. However, it would have been difficult for it to all make sense and could have broken the game as well. You know, time travel, paradoxes, all that business. Makes me immediately tired just talking about it. Leading up to its release, a lot of the fans were actually confused by the original CG trailer shown in 2015 compared to the actual in-game engine. The developers wanted the in-game graphics to feel as authentic and real as the CG trailer so that viewers didn't feel misled. Smith is a huge fan of the first Thief game and has noted multiple times that it was a big inspiration for the Dishonored series. In Dishonored 2, if you choose Corvo, you can look over the city from the room that he's locked in and he will say, that's a long way down. This line is also said in The First Thief. That wouldn't be a big deal or even a reference really, except Corvo is voiced by Steven Russell, who also voiced the main character Garrett in The First Thief game. In the sixth mission, Dust District, you can find Corvo's old house where he grew up. It has a plaque outside showcasing that it was his old home. Unfortunately, there isn't too much to see in the house. You can find Corvo's trophy that he got for winning the Blade Verbena, and it's possible to find his mother's diary as well. Dr. Alexandria Hypatia's name is actually a reference to Hypatia of Alexandria. Well, 
while the good doctor was an alchemist, Hypatia of Alexandria was a figurehead of the scientific schools of philosophy and astronomy. In the new Prey, which was also developed by Arcane Studios, two Dishonored reference appears in the Guts area where you can find Corvo's name on the wall. Established in 1798 is even written on the wall, which is the year Corvo was born. Dishonored 2 is a fairly long game that averages about 16 hours or so. Unless, of course, you're a speedrunner. At the time of recording this video, the world record holder, Bjorni, has beaten the game in 22 minutes and 59 seconds. A new feature introduced in Dishonored 2 was the faction system. There are two forces at war with one another, the Overseers, who are still super scary and creepy, and a new gang called the Howlers. The story progresses in different ways based on who the player chooses to side with. You can also choose to stay neutral and do your own thing. One thing that stayed consistent from Dishonored 1 to 2 was the cutscenes. They originally took place in the first person perspective because it made more sense than cinematic cutscenes, and then Dishonored 2 used them for the sake of continuity. In Dishonored 2, the music shifted depending on how the action unfolded. Music composer Daniel Licht made music specifically for every type of situation and wanted to have it coded within the game so it depended on what was happening. Bethesda, the publisher of Dishonored 2, had an interesting method of how their games were reviewed that year. Games are usually sent in advance to reviewers to have feedback up before the game is launched. However, for Dishonored 2, copies were sent out just a day before launch. The reason for this was never confirmed, though many guessed that Bethesda wanted the players to form their own verdict without reviews swaying them. On Metacritic, Dishonored 2 holds an average score of 87 across the Xbox One, PS4, and PC versions of the game. Critics noted how much the developers improved on what made the first Dishonored so special, especially when it came to the gameplay mechanics. However, some of the more negative critics stated that Dishonored 2 didn't do enough in terms of changing the scope of the genre. They also mentioned how the story fell flat and uninspired as well. Those of you that have played it, what do you think? A collector's edition was announced for Dishonored 2 that included a cool box, a steelbook case, art goodies, the same ring that Emily wears in the game, and a replica of Corvo's mask. Dishonored 2 launched on November 11th, 2016. However, the game was playable a day earlier to those who pre-ordered it. Dishonored 2's launch has gone down as one of the more disastrous AAA PC launches in recent gaming history. The initial PC version of the game was riddled with bugs, sluggish performance, and poor controls for the mouse and keyboard. While there aren't too many reports on how well it did or did not sell, one report in the UK stated that it sold roughly 40% fewer copies than the first Dishonored. When Dishonored 2 launched, it was the fourth top-selling game during its first week. In order, the top-selling games that week were Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, FIFA 17, Battlefield 1, and then Dishonored 2. While no follow-up has been announced for Dishonored 2, the first DLC for it was revealed at E3 2017. It's titled Death of the Outsider and will be released September 2017. The DLC stars Billy Lurk, who was the runner-up to fan-favorite Dowd. Dowd was one of the main villains in the first Dishonored, then was the protagonist in the two DLCs that were released for Dishonored 1. The main objective for Death of the Outsider? Well, if the title wasn't obvious enough, it's to kill the Outsider himself. Yeah, no big deal. I'm sure that'll be a walk in the park. Just walk on up and kill an omnipotent, chaotic, neutral, supernatural being. It's fine. Megan Foster, who was the boat captain in Dishonored 2, is actually, spoiler alert, Billy Lurk. Her boat in Dishonored 2 was called the Dreadful Whale, which is an anagram for Farewell Dowd. In the early stages of development for Dishonored 2, Smith had the idea of killing the Outsider, but he never truly fleshed it out until Arcane started working on Death of the Outsider. He felt that it made sense for Dowd to be the one who kills the Outsider with the help of Billy. While Dowd is the anchor in the story of killing the Outsider, the DLC focuses on Billy and her overall conflict with both Dowd and the Outsider. Billy wants to kill the Outsider because she feels that he's the core reason why everything has gone wrong. While she participates participated in the killing of the Empress and feels guilty for it, she believes the Outsider was pulling the strings and causing chaos. It wouldn't be a Dishonored game without supernatural powers. In Death of the Outsider, Billy still has supernatural powers, but they actually come from a different source in the form of artifacts. Rats were pretty terrifying in the first Dishonored game, right? However, in Death of the Outsider, Billy has a talisman which was given to her by her childhood friend Deirdre. The talisman allows Billy to talk with rats who give her advice and insight to her objective. After players complete Death of the Outsider for the first time, there's a new mode that the developers are lovingly calling Old Game Plus. It allows Billy to use a hybrid of both Emily and Corvo's abilities from Dishonored 2 with changes here and there to fit Billy's playstyle. Smith wanted to feature Billy as a main character for a long time and finally found the right moment with Death of the Outsider. He was excited to see what Rosario Dawson, the voice actress for both Megan and Billy, would bring to the table as a main character. Using Billy as a playable character meant giving the world a new perspective because Billy doesn't come from royalty, she's just a former assassin. Smith believes that she kills people who deserve to die and doesn't feel remorse for that. While Dowd is featured in the launch trailer for Death of the Outsider, he's not a playable character in the game. Billy will be the sole main character in Death of the Outsider. Death of the Outsider will feature a handful of new enemies. One that's appearing for the first time are the Sisters of the Oracular Order. They've been mentioned in both 
Dishonored games, but they will debut as enemies in Death of the Outsider. When developing Death of the Outsider, Smith wanted to keep the idea of world building consistent within it. Each mission will have its own unique theme and environmental storytelling as well. Clockwork Soldiers make a comeback in Death of the Outsider. While Kieran Jindosh, the creator of the Clockwork Soldier, has died, the ones in Death of the Outsider are meant to be prototypes. In the first reveal trailer for Dishonored 2, the Clockwork Soldiers are shown with more ceramic looking faces. However, in the actual game, they have wooden and bird-like faces. The prototypes in Death of the Outsider resemble the ceramic faces. While Death of the Outsider does take place after Dishonored 2, it serves as a standalone title. In fact, you don't actually need a copy of Dishonored 2 to play Death of the Outsider. Smith wanted to have Death of the Outsider be standalone because he didn't want people to be locked out if they didn't own Dishonored 2. He also felt that this could be someone's first entry into the Dishonored world. Since the expansion is a standalone, the team was able to branch out from standard DLC. They visited new areas in Karnaka, gave Billy a new set of animations, and made it feel like Dishonored 2 while still pushing the story further. So how does one kill the Outsider? Well, the Outsider came to be because a young boy was sacrificed in a ritual and had his throat cut. Billy just so happens to have that same blade that was used to create the Outsider, and I'm sure you can put the rest of the pieces together yourself. Death of the Outsider is meant to end the current arc of Dishonored, which featured Corvo, Emily, and the Outsider. So if a Dishonored 3 does happen, it'll be interesting to see all the new characters continuing the next chapter of their predecessor's story. And there you have it. Once again, I'm Jacob, and thanks for watching 107 Facts About Dishonored 2. Which character's story is your favorite? Should they make a third game? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of our notification squad, and if you like getting more from your games, subscribe to the leaderboard, where we help you game smarter. Thank you.